welcome back from the, from the recession. And I want to thank you everyone for being here for this wonderful conference today. Uh, now we're going to talk about regeneration and I'm honored to invite Professor Eli Keshet uh, for his, from uh, Hebrew University and he's talking about vascular aging and rejuvenation and health span expansion. He's also a Birak Sawodi uh, together with uh, Manuel Meyer from uh, King's College in London. So Professor Keshet. So, uh, let me just uh, set the timer. Okay. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, in Tel Aviv, in the UK. Uh, so, my talk is, uh, is a vascular-centered view on aging. And uh, this is a slide you probably have seen many, many times. It's usually the first slide that's being presented in most uh, aging meetings where people are talking about the, the, the hallmark of aging uh, round down the list before dwelling on their favorite own uh, uh, process, aging process. Now, th these are mostly, and I'm sure you will hear more about the uh, proteostasis, loss of proteostasis, deregulated uh, deranged metabolism, certainly about senescence. Uh, same thing and the other. But most of these are in fact uh, cell uh, intrinsic processes and even uh, cell autonomous processes. So I would like to zoom out and talk about the organ support system of which of course the vascular system is, is play a major role and therefore we, we would like to add vascular aging as a, a hallmark uh, of aging. Uh, now, uh, more than this, you know, usually when you talk about this different uh, hallmark of aging, you wonder whether it's a certain hierarchy, like uh, one drives the other. And we would entertain the idea that in fact vascular aging is an hierarchically high driver of aging at large. And this is not a new idea. In fact, uh, this is a, quota a quotation credited to the Thomas Sanderman, uh, years, uh, centuries ago, who said that a man is as old as his arteries, which means implied that the alt arterial age is what actually determine your uh, uh, physiological age. Now, of course, there are two amendments here. First of all, is the gender issue. It's not only men, it's, it's women as well. And, but the other thing is that it's not only arteries, but it's blood vessels at large, because aging affects the all component of the vascular tree, starting from the big uh, arteries, the big conduits, and all the way to capillary, which is the business end of the vascular system, where uh, the, the communication with the uh, cells of the organ uh, take place. And in fact, under the virus project, uh, Manuel Mayer uh, in KCL, he is working on arterial aging, mostly on the very well-known phenomena of arterial aging, which is known as arterial stiffness, that the arteries, the big arteries, lose their capacity to modulate uh, their size. You know that the vascular system is not just like your house plumbing. It's actually it's a breathing system that can they respond to all kinds of external cues and expand or attract its size. And this is the, what uh, Manuel is working on. We, in our lab in Jerusalem, we work mostly on the microvasculature, on the capillaries. And this is, in fact, the, the most dramatic phenotype of microvascular aging. Phenotype that's referred to as microvascular reaffection from the word wear, which is basically an age-related failure to maintain uh, adequate microvascular density because they are regress and they, usually there is no uh, somehow compensation for the gas vasculature. And uh, so we are working, I thought this has is, is, is been that the microvascular reflection is in fact uh, what drives aging. And you don't really need to be a vascular biologist to appreciate that if, if the cells of all organs are, are denied from direct contact and communication with the blood vessels, it's going to have far-reaching consequence because you know all the blood-borne substances, starting with oxygen, but also all uh, nutrients and hormone distribution are going to be impaired. And if you are a vascular biologist, you are certainly aware of the fact that now there is a major emerging awareness to the 
perfusion independent function of the vasculature, and this is the, the, driven by the endothelial cell secretome, uh, which is really uh, play many, many roles in the maintenance of the organ homeostasis, uh, including, for example, in the stem cell niches, where you know the vascular is, is an uh, integral com uh, component of it, and also have a limited diffusion range. So we thought then, why, why is that happening? And this brings me to VGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, the factor that we have been entertaining for more years that I would like to remember, and uh, which is, of course, is, uh, is the factor who promotes, uh, coordinate, and orchestrate all uh, angiogenic processes in the embryo and in the adult. And one of the important function of VGF is by Bisson synthesis and hypoxia inducible factor. So whenever the tissue senses that insufficient oxygen hypoxia, VEGF is induced, is upregulated, and it acts to recruit more blood vessels to the tissue. And this is the normal homeostatic function of VEGF. And uh, so we thought that if there is a failure to fulfill this job, maybe something happening with VEGF. And this is just to introduce the toolbox that we are using to modulate VEGF, so we use conditional uh, modulation of VGF. This is the well-known thesis to you of the TET-regulated uh, system that can use both VGF gain of function or VGF loss of function. This done by uh, driving VGF uh, by a uh, tissue-specific uh, trans activator so we can switch it on. And of course, the nice thing about it that you can, uh, just by changing the drinking water, you can switch it off as you see here. So we can basically induce VEGF at, at uh, a, any organ in time scale frame as well. Now, the loss of function system uh, is the same thing eventually, except that instead of switching on and off VEGF, we switch on and off a, a soluble receptor, uh, which functions as a decoy receptor. Instead of just uh, binding VEGF and transmitting the signal, it's secreted from the, from the fence. It includes the uh, ligand binding domain. It binds VEGF. It sequesters VGF, and in fact, function as a VGF trap and pre preclude AG, uh, VEGF signaling. So, um, so this is one which we engineered artificially in our uh, uh, transgenic mice. But as I'll show you in a minute, this, this, uh, this decoy receptor is also made naturally by way of alternative splicing of the transmembrane receptors. So I'll come to it in, in a minute. So uh, we use this system first to model all kinds of insufficient perfusion. And we start, I'll show you here, here from the heart, because Manuel and Mine project is sponsored by the British Heart Foundation, so we are also focusing on the heart. So this is what, this is, for example, you see the, the very dense uh, uh, micro, uh, micro vessels here in, in uh, in uh, brown in the heart. Now, if we just induce VEGF, and now we do it in specifically in the heart using a mouse every chain alpha promoter to drive the VGF trap, preclude VEGF signaling specifically in the heart, you see we, within a uh, long time, you see much reduced, uh, you see microvascular elevation, you see less vessels. And you see also if you do the vascular cast, and you can quantify your really drop in the microvascular density. Drop. And my point is that you can keep this situation for weeks and weeks and weeks and nothing happened. But as soon as you lift off the VGF blockade, within a week, you get complete revascularization and obey uh, to the normal density. So we, we take, use this experiment as, a, as a, a proof to the fact there is no, in fact, there is no backup for VGF in this capacity of keeping on the, microvas uh, the proper microvascular density. So uh, now, uh, so we thought, so maybe since, so the question is why VGF is not doing his job in aging, its natural physiological uh, role. And this is what we discovered, that this uh, uh, soluble receptor, soluble fleet, which we call the soluble fleet, one which engineered artificially, in fact, is produced naturally during aging. So if you monitor the plasma level using a solar fleet ELISA, you see it's increased with age, so we, and it's done by alternative splicing. We can measure this, the splicing ratio. So some, there is an alternative splicing switch from some reasons that now we are, I won't be have time to talk about it now with some ideas what could cause this, but this is sufficient to trap VEGF 
and preclusive signaling. So my idea was maybe we can overcome this by compensatory VHF, and that's what we have been doing. So why VHF has to do is working uh, in aging. So what we do, we use now our, our uh, transgenic uh, mouse model, this time with why VHF is the gain of function. Here is using a liver specific promoter lab, but VHF is secreted factor. It goes into circulation and you can measure in its circulation uh, the level of VHF. So what you see here in blue is in fact the natural, the homostatic levels of VHF. And we sort of calibrated, fine tuned the system so we pump into the circulation uh, only moderate increased VEGF, which is about twice its homeostatic levels. By the way, you can see also here that we are looking at mice that live for three years. There is a, a considerable extension of the lifespan. And now, uh, this, by the way, is also in the human. This is human proteomic. But what you see now, if we look at the signaling, uh, the VEGF, there is no decrease in VEGF, no problem in VEGF production because of dipoxia. It's even increased higher, but you know it's preventing from signaling. This is looking at phosphorylation of VGF receptor 2, which is the major signaling receptor, as you see in decrease in age, you see can see. But when we use this model, they call them old VEGF for short, you see we preserve the young-like level of, of signaling. So that's the trick. And now, this is doing all the miracles that I'm going to show you from this point on. So first of all, we see that indeed, what I've shown you before, the, the drop in the microvascular density in all organs, liver, muscle, uh, bed, with the, by the way, this is what is responsible to the thermoregulation and the white adipose tissue. Everything is like in the young. So we can completely preserve and maintain a young-like level of microvascular density. And that's probably sufficient to do this, uh, the whole things. For example, if you look at or the perfusion take at the oxygen level, this is by MRI measurement, and you see in three months mice, that's what it looks like. This is what happened, you know, in two years old mice, but this day littermate, which has been treated with VEGF and preserved the microvasculature, not surprisingly, you, you maintain the, the proper perfusion. Now, by the way, uh, I think, I think I'll be focusing mostly on the microvasculature, but if you block VEGF, if VEGF is prevented from signaling, there are many, many other consequences because VEGF plays not, in other words, for example, you know the blood vessels come in, in, very, in different flavors. And for, for example, in all uh, endocrine tissues, in the liver sinusoids, it's an fenestrated endothelium. There are sort of pores that, you know, hormones and other substances can go in and out. And we ought to find, we portrayed in this slide, that VEGF is also required to maintain the fenestra open. So what happened, for example, in this mice, in what we blocked VGF in our system, this is not a natural situation. You see here, this is the fenestra, these little holes that you see here in black, you see they're completely lost. So you need also VEGF signaling, proper signaling to block it. So, and uh, it's only when we lift off the blockade that we uh, gain the fenestration. So there are other uh, consequences that comes with uh, this VEGF uh, loss of function. So going back now, so this is the lifespan. Now, and you see here, this is the control mice and the uh, treated litter mate, and you see a very dramatic uh, lifespan expansion. It, indeed, it's very, very large. But as, as you know, now the, the issue is not extending lifespan, but the health span, you know, how you can sp ha uh, age healthier, because it's the prolonged life that really uh, what make all the diseases. So I, I draw your attention to the shape of this curve, that it's not just uh, the Kaplan-Meier curve, it's not just rightward shifting of the limb case, but you see the very almost unprecedented situation. You see this like the rectangularization of the curve, then the situation that when all the control mice are dead, the litter mates are almost all alive, which for us was the first suggestion that indeed they age uh, healthier. And this is what you found. And now I'll go through you uh, how much time allowing uh, all the phenotypes that it can really alleviate by this uh, treatment. First of all, the body composition, you know that this age, you had a very bad trade-off that you're lo losing your muscle, sarcopenia, and you get instead the uh, fat. And for example, if you look here for the abdominal fat, again by MRI, you see here in white that you really accumulate a lot of abdominal fat, but much less in the VGF treated mice. And if you look directly on the fat to lean ratio, I won't tell you, show you data due to time about how to preserve the 
we alleviate sarcopenia, but the fat to lean ratio, you see that you see in one year old, you don't see much difference, but one year later when the, the control mice are really gaining fat and losing muscle, not, not so much the, the other mice. Now, uh, of course, because of the oxygen, it's, it's, we look directly on respiration, and we look directly in oxygen consumption rates using the CEOs platform, to those of you who know. And we know if you look both on basal respiration and the maxillary respiration, you see how it's affecting this age, but how it's preserved in our mind, the, the oxygen consumption. And the, the, the muscle, this is just a one functional assay of the muscle generating force, and you, this is just subjecting mice to a water world. That is, you put them on a rotating world and you, see, you monitor how long they can hang, hang in, and you see, for example, these are the control mice and these are the treated mice, and you see that are hanging on much, much uh, better than this. This is, by the way, uh, we have now started repeating all this VEGF gain of function, not with a transgenic platform, but contemplating and thinking about future application. We are now using AAV, adeno-associated virus mediated delivery, and we fine tune uh, uh, the system such that we are sort of pumping into the circulation more or less the same level as in the transgenic mice. And for example, if you look here uh, on this, you see uh, the same uh, effect of uh, preserving the muscle strength. Now this is a, we haven't dwelled too much on the metabolism, only uh, some experiments we did at the Yossi Tam with the pharmacology department by a a a a a measuring a a mice individually caged in metabolic cases. And not surprisingly, because of the oxygen issue, you see that they can oxidize carbohydrates much better than, than the control. And if you look here on the, what's referred to as metabolic flexibility, or RER, the respiratory exchange ratio, which more or less is the flexibility of the mice for fuel use, whether they can, they can choose between uh, oxidizing carbohydrates or fat, and you see usually when there's a maximum uh, flexibility, it's a ratio of one, but when they completely lost their ability to, to utilize carbohydrates and totally rely on fat, it's 0.7, and you see here that we increase this uh, the, uh, metabolic flexibility as well. Now, steatosis, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver, which is a, a hallmark of aging. You see directly on the picture, this is standing with oil rate O, which you see the oil droplets, and you see with age, how old are these mice? I, I, I forgot, oh, these are two years old uh, mice, and you see they really accumulate a lot of fat, but none in, in this mice, and if we look at uh, liver injury and we look for ALT and AST, which are used, you know, as a marker, serum marker for vascular injury, you see a uh, much reduced level of vascular injury. Now, this is an essence for uh, Valerie. Uh, we haven't worked in much, but if, for example, look at the liver, and you look at the senescent cell by standing with uh, senescence beta gal, you see the accumulation of senescent cell, which we see are in fact mostly confined to the endothelium. It's mostly the endothelial cells which account for, for the senescence in the liver. And if you look directly on the endothelial cell that we uh, pre saw them, this is the com com combinatory fax uh, sorting that you're just looking directly on the endothelial cells, and we look what fraction of them are also senescence, expressing the beta gal senescence, the beta gal, you see that it increased with age uh, dramatically, but not as much as the VGF treated mice. I skip kiposis, this is the curvature, the vertebral spine curvature, but I want to show, uh, how much do I? Three minutes, great. So this is uh, now the bone loss osteoporosis, and uh, we see uh, that for example, if we look at the bone density, this is a cut through the hind limb for the femoral artery, and you see in two years old female mice, uh, you see the bone is thin, al you, you almost lost the uh, whole of your bone uh, material. But in our mice, these are little mates, you see very well preservation of, of this. And we, we, we see also see that the, also the vasculature there is there because our walking, uh, thoughts are that in fact you lose the vessels, and with the vessels you lose the, the tissue, be it the muscle or the, or the, the other cells, or, or the bone mass. Uh, why is, is it stuck? It's stuck? OK, 
Okay. And my last, my last data slide is a chronic inflammation, which is a very important hallmark of aging, known as inflammation aging. And you see here four different readouts for the chronic inflammation, and uh, for example, uh, the blood granulocyte, C-reactive protein, MCP1, RNA, and protein. And you see all of them, which you see increased level in the plasma. These are all plasma ELISA. You see, you, you see much less this and another, another thing because a chronic inflammation has been associated causally associated with tumor uh, it's a proponent of tumor progression i don't have the, the, the data slide here but we all see a reduced tumor burden in, in the mice and this is basically the summary of uh, this work uh, so what we think is that what you have here is that uh, i'm sorry that you see here, because of the increase in the VGF decoy receptor, you have reduction in VGF signaling. In red, you see all the changes that take place naturally in aging, and in green, the one that we are alleviating. And you see, so it, we can correct the VGF signaling, we can rectify the, the loss, or the capital loss, uh, restore uh, proper perfusion and oxygenation, and all the things that affect the metabolism, adipose tissue, and there are several other things that I have didn't have the time to look, but it's all been published three months ago in Science. Those of you who are working to interested in looking at in the details can look at that. Now, uh, I'll uh, I just say uh, in passing that uh, we also use, we now think that the soluble fleet is really the, the decoy receptor is what happened. So we are now developing this system as a model to model premature aging. In other words, we induce uh, the, this decoy receptor conditionally in our transgenic platform ahead of the normal schedule when it's made during aging. And in fact, you see first of all that, for example, you, you accelerate the loss of the capillaries and with this, we are now going by one one on all the the aging phenotype that I've showed you that we can delay, and now we can accelerate and have an earlier presentation. So this is our model for this, and I'll skip all this uh, thing due to time, and I'll just like to end up, and I cannot close this without acknowledging Miriam Grunwald from my lab, who spearheaded all this project in almost uh, solely responsible for advancing this project, of course, with a lot of outside collaboration. And thank you for attention.